Greetings, friends. I hope you've had a, a wonderful week. And now as the week draws to a close, we have the Sabbath to look forward to. The Sabbath is such a wonderful gift from the Lord. And you know, I treasure every minute of it. And I must tell you, one of my favorite things about the Sabbath is going to Sabbath school. Whether in person or online, Sabbath school offers each of us the opportunity to come closer to God through the study of His Word, through learning more about mission, and as circumstances permit, fellowshipping together. You see, in the book, Councils on Sabbath School Work, we read the Sabbath school is an important branch of the missionary work, not only because it gives to young and old a knowledge of God's Word, but because it awakens in them a love for its sacred truths and a desire to study them for themselves. Above all, it teaches them to regulate their lives by its holy teachings. What a privilege we have to be a part of Sabbath school. Whether in person or online, to be invigorated by the study of God's Word and then to apply it in very practical ways. For you see, it is the Word of God that gives life and growth. Now in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 we read, For the Word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You see, this beautiful passage is something that can bring life and growth in our Sabbath schools. The Sabbath school lesson study should be an interactive time led by the teacher yet offering many opportunities for class members to share together, offering insights from their own Bible study during the week and diving into the biblical concepts presented in the Sabbath school lesson. Sabbath school should not be another church service. Let everyone participate in studying the Word of God and in sharing what it means to them. That's a true Sabbath school class. If you'd like more information about how you can make your Sabbath school come alive, I encourage you to visit alive.adventist.org for videos and many more free resources. Now, while Bible study is certainly a key element of Sabbath school, Mission also plays a vital role, both locally and globally. The Sabbath School provides a place where members can share experiences they are having in reaching out and ministering to others in their community through total member involvement and inspiring others to do the exact same thing. It also provides time to see what is happening in mission around the world. One of the best ways to do this is by watching the short Mission Spotlight programs provided free of charge each week by Adventist Mission. These outstanding videos, as well as mission magazines filled with more great stories, are available for free download at AdventistMission.org. Sabbath School, of course is not just for adults. It is a wonderful place for children and young people to learn more about Jesus, His Word, His Church, His mission, and to cultivate strong Christian friendships and a love for service. I praise the Lord for the thousands of dedicated Sabbath school teachers around the world who take the time each week to carefully guide and nurture their young students. You will never know until eternity, heaven itself, the impact that you as a teacher are making in the lives of these precious young people. Thank you for what you are doing. Praise God for your example and service.
Friends, did you know that Sabbath school can be one of the most effective, soul-winning opportunities that we have? We read in councils on Sabbath school work the following. The Sabbath school should be one of the greatest instrumentalities and the most effectual in bringing souls to Christ. I praise God for the wonderful opportunities that Sabbath school gives us in so many ways. And I would like to invite you to participate in a special way this coming Sabbath, which has been designated Sabbath School Guest Day by the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. Why not invite a friend or a family member to join you in coming to Sabbath School this week, whether it's in person or online. And even if your church is not able to meet in person, there are many Sabbath schools now available right online, and I invite you to participate. I encourage you to ask your local pastor for more information about how to connect with a virtual Sabbath school online. May the Lord bless you as you take the opportunity to be a part of Sabbath school. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God that binds us together through a common understanding of what you have done for us, what you are doing for us, and what you will do for us. Thank you for the Bible. It's such a vital part of Sabbath school. And Lord, thank you for friendships and fellowship that we can have in Sabbath school, in small Sabbath school classes. Thank you for the members of these Sabbath school classes. Help us to stay close to them and encourage each other. And thank you, Lord, for mission outreach, whether it is local or global. Help us to be interested, vitally interested, in the outreach of our church, for we know that Jesus is coming soon. Thank you, Lord, for Sabbath school, and bless each one of us as we participate. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. everyone, how are you? My name is Mchare Mbakao Nwe from Harare City Center SDA. My favorite verse is 1 John chapter 4 verse 19, which says, we love because he first loved us. I'm so inspired by the love of God that he loved me before I even knew about him. My favorite hymn is uh, number 197 uh, from the Advent hymn now. And Christ in song, it's number 52, it says, Come thou fount of uh, every blessing. I love it so much because it tells me that uh, everything that I am has to do with the grace of God who empowers me. Otherwise, on my own, I fall short. Thank you. Enjoy your Sabbath. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Um, I'm here to introduce to you the fourth quarter lesson that we'll be studying, Christian education. This is a very important uh, uh, topic that we'll be studying. And uh, today, our lesson one is titled Education in the Garden of Eden. If we just look at a high level, what we should always be remembering as we go through this quarter, there are about two or three important points that I need to highlight. That uh, we need to always realize that God 
himself is the source of everything. As the creator in the book of Genesis, he is the one who created everything and created us. So, if you want to know what Christian education is, the true education, we must go back to the source. And we do this um, through the scriptures. The scriptures are the ones that reveal who God is and our and his intention for us. And we also learn that even as God was creating, nature also reveals who God is. And we can see um, that from the creation that was um, that is talked of uh, in, the, in the book of Genesis. Uh, one of the ultimate uh, aims of the lesson, in fact the whole series in this court, is for us as Christians to understand what true education is. We've understood that we can also be able to understand what we must be doing to make sure that all our members, all our children get the proper education. So if we just go back to our lesson number one, the key verse is Job 36 verse 22. It says, Behold, God is exalted by his power. Who teaches like him? It then introduces us to the fact that the ultimate and the greatest teacher is God himself. If we go to the Garden of Eden, we realize that this was the first school. We have got the classroom as the Garden of Eden. We have got the teacher as God himself. We have got the students as Adam and Eve. And from there we can pick two important lessons. That God, when he was creating, he did two things. He created with purpose. He also created with responsibility. He was giving everything responsibility, including Adam himself was then given responsibility as the ultimate uh, steward. So that nature that was created by God could even could also te teach him. Uh, but God did not stop there. He still came to commune with, the, with, this, with this pair and speak to his students and interface with them directly. We also learned that one of the key things as you are setting up the classroom environment, one of the key things that he did, God, was to put obedience as the centerpiece of the character that we need as students to learn. So if we want to learn as students, we must be obedient. There's no student who learns when they're not obedient to the teacher. And if we're obedient to the master, do what he, he says in his scriptures, we will be able to be better placed to learn. And then we then learn later on, we then see um, in Genesis uh, 3, an intrusion happening. We see the deceiver coming and uh, deceiving uh, Eve. And a key point from there is that we see that Eve was deceived and ended up disobeying. And if we look at how it happened, the cunning part of the devil was simply to highlight that I want to give you freedom. This teacher of yours, the obedience that he requires from you is too restrictive. And brothers and sisters, are we not seeing the same in today's world? When we are told that God is too restrictive, God is imprisoning us. We want to be free. As the desire of freedom uh, goes into us, it is being whispered into our hearts by the same deceiver who deceived him. And Eve then ended up disobeying because she had uh, simply sought to, to, to get this freedom and to say, I can live independent of God. And this is also the same thing that we get into, into, into today's world. We are hearing that we must be independent people. We must be free thinkers. Thinkers outside the knowledge that God has given us. And we then see that our first parents were then uh, kicked out of the classroom. But through God's mercy, we see that they, he didn't abandon them. He still managed to make sure that they will be able to restore everything that they had uh, lost. If we go to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, from verse 2, 
uh, the apostle writes and says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power is given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye, may, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we are given assurance here that indeed we can restore everything that was lost by our parents if we seek the true knowledge of God and the true knowledge of Jesus. This is indeed the true Christian um, education. We also get a warning from the Apostle Peter as well as he talks about this spirit of wanting to be rebellious, to be disobedient. And he then says, this is the same, or the same spirit that may lead us to despise authority. And then as we do that, we jeopardize ourselves from getting the true uh, education. Now, uh, as a summary, I just leave, I want to leave to you these um, uh, thoughts, uh, brothers and sisters. As... Uh, Eve was moving away from the true education, from the true great teacher God himself, being influenced by the wrong teacher who was the deceiver. She was offered freedom from God. She was offered independence. She was offered to be more knowledgeable. And we know that this knowledge is the one that is not the true uh, Christian education. And we also hear that, we also see that the same deceiver still whispers this to our hearts. And as we will be studying in this quarter, may we open our hearts and remember that indeed scripture is our safeguard as we continue to learn. Nature is still there for us to learn, but scripture is indeed our true safeguard in terms of learning uh, and Christian education. May we always remember that. Let's go back to the source himself for us to have the true Christian education. Now, I've got a small call for you, brothers and sisters. I want those who may just commit to say, in this quarter, the last quarter of 2020, such a difficult uh, year, May we learn about Christian education. May we dedicate ourselves to listen to God. And as we do that, we will be knowledgeable of what God expects uh, of us. I invite to pray with those who are taking this call. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you with contrite hearts. We just ask that you forgive us for all our sins. As we come to you, Lord, may you help us to understand that true education indeed uh, comes from you. And may we have the obedient spirit of listening to you, the great and the master teacher, so that we can indeed be ready for your soon coming. May you help all of us and all those we have committed to be studying in this quarter to understand this and help themselves to be ready for your second coming. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I've heard the church talk about this plan called I Will Go. It's got my attention, but what is it? I Will Go is the brand new strategic plan for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The phrase is rooted in key passages like Isaiah 6, when Isaiah responded to God's call by saying, Here am I, send me. And Matthew 28, when Jesus said, therefore go and make disciples. Now it's our turn. The strategic plan is part of our response. It will do two things. One, equip you with what you need to embrace your call to mission. And two, provide you with indicators to track your progress as you respond, okay, Jesus, I will go. I think I'm following, but what is that mission? I'm glad you asked. 
Our mission as Adventists is to make disciples of Jesus Christ who live as his loving witnesses and proclaim to all people the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages in preparation for his soon return. It is a big task, but no one has to do it alone. We have a massive support system of more than 21 million members in over 160,000 congregations throughout the world. Phew, that's a lot of members. Have we made progress? With that many, how could we not? But we're always open to improvement. I Will Go builds on the success of our previous strategic plan called Reach the World, where we set out to, let me guess, reach the world? <laughs> what gave it away? Following Reach the World, the church evaluated the effectiveness of our different initiatives worldwide to gain valuable insights for the future. Basically, after years of work and research, we developed that evaluation system and transformed it into a strategy that will run from 2020 to 2025, which we're calling I Will Go. Okay, evaluation, got it. What happens with those insights? Adventist church leaders create a plan and then what? Just tell the world what to do? <laughs> Not at all. All that research will only be worthwhile if Adventists all around the world engage, collaborate, and innovate right where they are. I Will Go isn't about telling you what to do. It's about helping you follow through with what God has already placed on your heart. Every spiritual influencer needs support to be successful, and the church wants to provide that. Ooh, I like the idea of getting support. So how does it work? I Will Go is made up of 10 objectives that are divided into three areas of impact, mission, spiritual growth, and leadership. Each objective has its own key performance indicators, or KPIs for short. KPIs are measurable ways to help you determine whether or not you are achieving your current objective. There's no sign-up needed. They're there for you as you need them. Think of them like segments in a progress bar. Progress tracking sounds great, but what if I don't even know where to start? Don't worry. The KPIs also serve as a sort of brainstorming tool with examples to help you get started. Some KPIs are intended for those in church leadership roles. Others are intended for individuals like you and me. And the objectives can help you determine which KPIs to use. The great thing is, if the Holy Spirit inspires you to create something completely new that isn't on the list, yet accomplishes the mission, go for it. What about church initiatives we've already been doing? Does this mean that we'll replace them? Nope. Initiatives like digital evangelism or revival and reformation are actually methods of fulfilling the I Will Go plan. Take, for example, hmm, the TMI initiative. Too much information? <laughs> no, total member involvement. Oh, I've heard of that. It's where all members of the Adventist Church are involved in some form of intentional mission. Yes, sir. TMI is just one way to fulfill the I Will Go plan because it seeks to involve everyone. I'd share more, but... I don't want to give you too much information. <laughs> I see what you did there. So basically, the I Will Go strategy helps Adventists like me create brand new initiatives and improve the initiatives that we already do. You got it. I Will Go is not some feel-good slogan for lukewarm members to comfortably observe mission from afar. If we're serious about completing the mission, we need to strategize. That's why we're urging all who bear the Adventist name to understand and embrace the I Will Go strategic plan from the areas of impact down to the KPIs. We may talk the talk, but the I Will Go plan translates our mission into tangible, realistic goals in order to walk the walk. By applying them, we can ensure we practice what we preach. I think I get it now. This is a rallying cry for Adventists everywhere to fully embrace the calling God has placed on them. Jesus commanded, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And this is our opportunity to say, I will go. Whenever the Holy Spirit inspires you with ideas for how you and your local church can make an impact, we challenge you to respond, I, I will go. go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to A Triple Kids. I forgot to say you, but the people. From Cap Town. Have fun. So the story goes after being kicked out of Eden, humanity took a turn for the worse. I mean, people were lying, and they were stealing, they were hurting each other, and they were hurting themselves. And quite frankly, God was tired of it. In all of the world, there was one family that was fine and righteous in the sight of God. And that was Noah his wife, his three sons, 
and their wives. So one day, God goes to Noah, and he's like, uh, Noah? And God's like, yes, Lord. And he's like, Noah, I am honestly tired of all the sin that is happening, and I'm going to destroy the world with a flood. And I need you to do something for me. And Noah's like, uh, well, what do you want me to do, Lord? And God is like, well, I need you to build an ark so that you and your family and two of every animal could be safe. I'm going to give you the instructions on how to do it, and you will build the ark, please. And Noah's like, well, right away, Lord. And because Noah was faithful to God, he started building. Now, the neighbors saw this, and they started making fun of Noah. Like, one day they would go, Hey, neighbor! And Noah would be like, Hello, Bob. He's like, mm, So tell us again! What are you doing? What are you doing, Noah? And he said, I'm building an ark, Bob. And Bob was like, mm, An ark! <laughs> what are you going to do with that ark, Noah? And he said, Well, <sighs> I've been instructed to build an ark, and then I need to get two of every animal on board. And Bob is like, mm, two of every animal on board. <laughs> be careful, Noah. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be consumed by a jaguar. <laughs> and Noah's like, uh, thanks, Bob. But Noah kept building and building until it was done. And when it was done, God said, okay, get two of every animal to be on the ark. And two by two, the animals started coming. There was an elephant, and there were ducks, and all the animals were coming. And Bob came to witness, and he said, no, you will see the jack you am. <laughs> What are you doing with the animals? And Noah said, well, they're going in two by two like God said they should, Bob. He said, <laughs> even the iguanas? And Noah said, even the iguanas. And Bob and the neighbors were laughing. <laughs> What's going to happen? He's going to be consumed by a jaguar and an iguana. <laughs> Maybe that's coincidence. Oh. And it started raining. And it was too late for Bob and the neighbors because the ark doors had already closed. And it rained and rained and rained until the entire earth was covered. Now, the story goes further, but I'm going to stop here for now because here I, I want to focus on how Noah stayed true to God despite people making fun of him and mocking him and things not seeming to make sense. He stayed faithful to God. And in as much as Noah stayed faithful to God, we need to stay faithful to God as well. Even when our friends laugh at us, even when it doesn't seem like it's supposed to make sense or it's things that are supposed to happen, we should remain faithful to God because He has our best interest at heart. Amazing story, huh? Bible Stories, this is Tab. Who are the Seventh-day Adventists? Who took the Adventist message to India? Or who took it to other countries? What is the history of Adventist universities, hospitals, and other institutions around the world? My great-grandparents were missionaries to Lake Titicaca. Where can I find information about them? What if we could have reliable answers to these and other questions at our fingertips. This is now possible using the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists online.
The Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, or the ESTA Online, is a global church project that includes an estimated 8,500 entries, accompanied by photographs, media, and original documents in an online portal accessible to anyone. The ESTA Online is a great tool for those seeking to do research and learn more about the Seventh-day Adventist Church around the world, and also for those looking to witness to others. The ESTA Online is the Adventist Church's first online reference work, available to the public since June 2020. This free website will be periodically updated and expanded. Some people may ask, why a new encyclopedia? Why not just update the current encyclopedia? Well, almost 25 years after the second revised edition of the Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia, and more than half a century after publication of the first edition, the Seventh-day Adventist Church needs a new reference work, one that embodies the diverse Adventist Church of the 21st century, that reflects the tremendous growth in the church in the last 50 years and the shifts in global membership, and that incorporates the latest Adventist historical scholarship. But it also needs an online encyclopedia that includes all the possibilities of the digital age and enables interactive engagement by readers. During its spring meeting at the Adventist Church headquarters in April 2015, the General Conference Executive Committee approved a budget for the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, the ESDA. The ESDA is a brand new reference work. It includes historical data from world regions that previously were left out of the encyclopedia. Also, even though the authors of the earlier editions really did try to present an international, worldwide perspective, there are some that feel that it was written mostly from a North American perspective. The ESTA draws on the expertise of hundreds of scholars, teachers, and authors worldwide. About 30 assistant editors and research assistants and 25 consultant editors from all 13 divisions, the Middle East and North Africa field, and the General Conference work on the encyclopedia. The advantage of worldwide involvement is that the editors and authors can collect materials from their local churches, such as letters and diaries that members keep and never think of sharing unless asked. They can also collect information based on old tradition by conducting interviews with surviving relatives or people who know about specific historical events. Sadly, such information can vanish if not put in writing. One of the main goals of this encyclopedia is to be a missional tool to reach the world with the Adventist message and highlight the missional challenges still remaining in order to reach the world. Other goals are to supply reliable information on Adventist history, crucial events and themes, organizations, entities, institutions, and people, strengthen Adventist identity in a fast-growing worldwide movement, heightening awareness of distinctive doctrinal and prophetic beliefs, and provide a reference work for those new to the Adventist faith, mature in the faith, and not of the Adventist faith, to learn about all aspects of Adventism. All ESTA articles are signed and include notes and sources. The goal of each ESTA article is to be primary source-based, honest, open, comprehensive, and rigorous, representative of the diversity and richness of Adventism, and fully understandable to both church members and the public. Thousands of articles are completed and in writing, but many topics still need authors. We welcome members from all walks of life with expertise on a given subject, not only scholars specializing in history or theology, to contribute articles to the encyclopedia or to suggest a new topic. Browse the article list on the ESDA website and consider what are some other topics that merit inclusion in the encyclopedia? It may be a forgotten person that you think people should know about. It may be the Adventist work in the country or city in which you were born. You may want to suggest an article on a school or ministry, or write about Adventist engagement with an issue such as social activism, religious freedom, or the environment. If you want to suggest a new topic or contribute an article, please check the Get Involved page for the author guidelines and write to encyclopedia at gc.adventist.org or leave a message to the ESDA website. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teaching in our past history. 
It's a familiar statement by Ellen G. White, one of the Adventist Church pioneers and co-founders, but with lasting significance. And for us to know God's teachings and leadings, we need to know the facts of our history. Help us fulfill that inspired admonition to remember, record, and rehearse the history of God's church so that together we may go forward fearlessly into the future. I'm excited about the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists online. It will make research about the Adventist church so much easier and more engaging. I will use it and share it with my friends and other people who want to learn more about my faith and my church. Encyclopedia.adventist.org, representing the diversity and richness of Adventist heritage. Been given this rip from Somebody and Jesus is everything. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord, let me hear you blow your horn just for a moment and magnify the Lord with me. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go unto the house of the Lord. One thing have I asked of the Lord, and this one thing, that's all I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I'm so glad that you're here. And we do have a word from the Lord today. Somebody say amen. amen. We are going to a place where God wants us to be. I'm so glad to see each and every one of you. I told somebody this week that you didn't have to come. Somebody say amen. amen. You don't have to come, but thank God there's something on the inside that lets you know that I just want to go hang out with the people of God. Because there's something that happens in the church house that doesn't happen in the White House, doesn't happen in the crack house, and it does not truly happen in your house. Can I get an amen? So we're glad that we're all here. 
for God to do what he has to do. Let's pray as we do what God wants us to do. Father, the moment has come and they're here now. And we thank you, Lord, even for our neighbors as they listen. We pray in a very special way that, Master, you may nudge us. You may prick us. You may take us to a place where only your spirit knows how we can go there. In Jesus' name, I pray that, Lord, you may receive maximum glory this morning. And you may shower upon this anticipating audience the gift of growth. God, have your way in this place. Holy Spirit, your credit history is perfect with me. I know what you can do. You are more than good to all of us. So, God, we pray that you may teach us and lead us and guide us and take us to the place where we can soar and see things from the perspective of God. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen and amen again. I, I, I'm just going to take you to a place today. I, I'm going to speak on the subject, finding God in the fight. Finding God in the fight. All of us can fight. Uh, we are fighting something. The truth of the matter, some are fighting ailments. Some are fighting health situations. And others are fighting mental situations. Others are fighting addictions that they want to get over. But as Paul says, the more they, that which they are not to do is what they find themselves doing. They're not doing because they want to do. They are doing because they have no power to let it go. So everybody here today and even in the homes are fighting something. America is trying to fight this pandemic. How can we slow it down? 165,000 fellow Americans have died. And so everybody is fighting the Congress is fighting. Should we extend the benefits to the unemployed? They are playing games in those marble pace places and listen, everybody is fighting something. Yeah. But I want to talk to somebody this morning. Yeah. How do I find God in the fight? Because not every fight is a good fight. Paul says, I have fought a good fight, which implies that not every fight is a good fight. God wants you to fight, but the fight has to be a good fight, and there are ways of fighting a good fight. Come on, talk to me, somebody. We are all going through these things where somebody can choose to fight their loneliness and depression with a bottle of liquor. That's not good fighting. Somebody might take reefer and weed and smoke it, not because they love it, but because they want to calm down their anxieties. Here's the question. How are you fighting in your fight? And I just want to share with you that we can find God in the fight and we want to show you how to find him. The book of Samuel chapter 17, you know the story. The story is of David and Goliath. And when you read, have time to read the story, you're going to discover four things that stands out in 1 Samuel chapter 17. You discover that, listen, giants arrive at any time. When you read this chapter, you discover that David had gone over to check on his brothers because his father had sent him there. And while she was wondering and doing his own business, out of nowhere, a giant came and the giant started speaking and the everybody ran away. Well, I want you to understand that giants come from anywhere. It may be the giant of depression, the giant of your health, the giant of your money. I want you to understand bad things come from anywhere. You don't have to plan. You don't have to be bad, you don't have to be greedy, you don't have to be to be the bad person in the neighborhood, but I want you to understand, you need to understand this, as long as you are human, giants will sneak in on you any time. And the second thing you discover in this story, giants are not to be taken lightly. Somebody blow your horn up. I, I, I just want you to understand, see, m m many of us don't fight right because we chip in everything. We take everything lightly. There are some crazy people. I call them crazy. Please forgive me. I may say it respectfully. It's crazy for you to take Corona lightly. Amen. Amen. Yeah, it, it's really crazy for you to think that the mask is the worst thing that you can ever have. Amen. Hallelujah. I didn't expect many, many blows of homes there because we, we still have some crazy people. It's crazy for you to watch CNN and you are told if we keep going without the mask, we are going to lose 300,000 people. That means we have 140 who are supposed to die if we take this giant lightly. Amen. So what we learn from 1 Samuel 17 is that giants are not to be taken lightly. 
And I don't know what your giant is in your life. It starts with you taking your giant seriously if you want to win the battle against the giant. The third thing you discover in this first Samuel chapter 17, Gil, is that each giant has strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, here it is. Every giant got strengths. If you read first Samuel chapter 17, uh, if you read the first half of the chapter, you would think that Goliath won. If you read it, we are told of how tall he was. We are told how bad his weapon was. We are told how his voice and his words made Israel run away for 40 days. If you read half of the chapter, you think that this giant had won. But when you keep on going, you're going to discover that the giant was covered everywhere minus his forehead. And whatever God had to do was to slaughter the giant through the weakness of the giant. So I don't know what you're fighting this morning. I, I, I don't know what you're going through, but I want you to understand there's always a way. Giants have strengths, but giants also have weaknesses. It does not matter what you're going through right now. There's a window of escape in every situation. There's a window of escape in every giant. Every giant has got a spot that's open. If God is going to do something special, he's not going to do it by the, through the strengths of the giant, but God is going to slaughter the giant through the weaknesses of the giant. That's why you should never give up. It don't matter what giant you're facing right now, it has a weakness. Somebody say amen. 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 The fourth thing you discover is that every giant can be defeated. Somebody say amen. amen. Every giant can be defeated. Every giant can be defeated. Every giant. I, I, I don't know which giant you are dealing with, but every giant can be defeated. That's why you should never put a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Uh -huh. That's why you should never put a permanent solution to a temporary problem because every giant can be defeated. Cancer can be defeated. Uh, corona can be defeated. You, this is what keeps us going as believers. You need to understand it doesn't matter how big the giant is. Unemployment can be defeated. We went through the Great Depression and the country came out of that. We went through SARS and the country came out of that. We went through Ebola and the country came through that. We went through polio and the country came through that. And I want you to understand every giant can be defeated. That's why you cannot give up. That's why we don't have an option of quitting and giving up. But here it is. As I preach now, this is just a summary of the chapter. So how do I find God in the fight? Uh, one thing I've discovered is that David, as he was there walking around, and I want, to, I want you to understand something too. Uh, uh, whenever you do God's biddings, you, your purpose is always tied to you doing God's bidding. When you look through scripture, there are some men whose destiny changed because they were doing what their father had told them to do. Anybody knows of the boy Joseph? Joseph went to see his brother because his father had told him to go there. And whilst he was doing the beating of his father, he was transported to his destiny. Anybody remembers a man who was taller than everybody in Israel called Saul? The Bible says his father sent him to look for his lost donkeys. It was whilst obeying the father's mandate that he became king. And there's a special man in the Bible who came through the bed door of a ghetto called Bethlehem. He came in and he was born in a manger. And if you were to ask him why he came, you will let you know I came to do my father's bidding. Whenever you are about God's business, watch out because God is about to reveal something that he can only reveal to those who are doing God's will. And I want you to understand that's why as a believer you cannot quit. You start quitting when you start walking away from what God wants you to do. As long as you do what God wants you to do, they somebody who once said God makes himself personally responsible for your success. Why? Because if it's his will, it's his bill. Somebody say amen. So here it is. Here it is now. David goes over. And we discover four things I want to share with you. Finding God in the fight. The very first thing you'll discover is this. When we, we may face situations beyond our reserves but never beyond God's resources. When David came in, they told him, David, the king told him, you are too young. His brother told him, you are full of yourself. 
the giant told him, hey, who do you think I am? In other words, he, this situation was beyond his reserves. It was beyond what he had done. It was beyond what they thought should happen. A national hero cannot be a 17-year-old boy who is walking in with peanuts and some cakes to give to his brothers. It was beyond his reserves. But I want you to understand when you're finding God in the fight, you discover that I, I may not, it may be beyond my reserves, but it is never beyond God's resources. In other words, God is more for you to work with than you think you don't have. God has, oh God, here it is. They thought that David needed to have a spear, yet God had some five smooth stones in the bed of the river. God had resources for the man. They thought that David was going to listen to Goliath and never respond, but he responded to the giant as a resource. Here it is. God is our source. Never get this thing twisted. God is always your source who always gives you resources to outcome and to overcome the reserves that you don't have. So whatever fight you are fighting this morning, and I do understand that the situation may be beyond your reserves, but it is never beyond God's resources. The second thing you discover in First Samuel chapter 17 is that the greater the problem, come on, talk to me, the greater our opportunity to tap into God's power. The greater the problem, the greater our opportunity to tap into God's power. And here it is when you read through scripture from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you're going to discover that when the problem was greater, the opportunity to tap into God's power was even more visible. In other words, when things looked like they were not going to go the way they were supposed to go, God has a way of coming close to us when things are hardest. When it's hardest, can I say this? Here is somebody says, the stars shine the brightest when the night is the darkest. Come on, talk to me. In other words, the darker the night, the brighter the stars. And I want you to understand whatever you are fighting, there are more opportunities for you to make Make it than for you to tank in it. Why? Because the greater the problem, the closer the many opportunities God had. Here was Father Abraham on top of the mountain of Mount Moriah. He was on top of the mountain. He was supposed to kill his boy and he thought all was done and all was finished. After he said his prayer, back to let the knife come down so that Isaac could die out of nowhere. The hand of God simply slipped out of the invisible world and blocked the knife and God God said, I have seen what you have done. Just look over your shoulder. And when you looked over your shoulder, here it is. He had an opportunity to tap into God's power because the problem God had put to him was greater than him. And when he looked over his shoulder, he saw a ram caught in the thicket. Now, you may not shout on that unless you know what I'm about to tell you. Rams are not found on top of mountains. In other words, they don't go to the apex of the mountain. Somebody said, whilst Father Abraham was pressing on the upward way new heights as he was gaining in his obedience to the place of sacrifice somebody said it's not written in the bible but i believe it somebody says one step of obedience brought the ram to make one step on the other side of the mountain he was climbing on one side and the ram was climbing on the other side because as the problem became larger you need to understand he had access to tap into the power of god so I want to challenge you, whatever it is that you're fighting here today, it may be sickness, it does not matter, it may be this pandemic, as more people die, the people of God ought to get into our prayer closet. I'm not talking about our display, our public display to impress the world that the church is praying. I'm talking about you going into your private chamber, closing the door, and privately agonizing and pleading for the world, because God says, if my people who are called by my name, the greater the problem, the greater our opportunity to tap into God's power. In other words, when your problem is bigger, don't rush to the phone, rush to the throne. Somebody say amen. Number three, here it is. How do I find God in the fight? The closer we walk with God, the clearer we see his guidance. So David was a man after the heart of God. Whilst everybody was running away from Goliath, watch this, because David was so close in his walk with God, when Goliath started speaking, 
David said, who is this uncircumcised Christian? And they said, what are you doing? In fact, he remained alone because everybody had run away. Day 40, for 40 days, they were running away in the morning, running away in the evening. But day 41 introduced a man who had walked closer with God. And because he had walked closer with God, he was clear on the guidance of God. I want to tell somebody, I don't know how long you've been running from your fight, but day 41 is coming. Somebody say amen. I mean, I don't care how long you've been put down by the giant, but I want you to understand that the giant has day 41 coming. And here he is. He said, wait a minute. I have served a God who can do this. And Saul says, you are too young. And David says, you don't know what I know. Somebody blow your horn. You just don't know what I know. The same God. God delivered me from the bear. God delivered me from the lion. In other words, here it is. The closer you work with God, the more reference points that God drops in your life. Yeah. In other words, it's not the giant, but it is what God has done for you. Just look over your shoulder. Do I have somebody who can testify that the Lord has been good to you and the Lord has been faithful to you? It's not the giant in front of you. It's your God behind you. It's what God has done in the past. That Oh God, one writer says, we have no reason to be afraid of the future unless we forget how God has led us in the past. As long as I can remember God what he has done for me in the past you don't care what's in front of me Goliath you are coming down because I found my God he has been faithful in my past and surely he will not leave me alone he has declared I'll never leave you nor forsake you he has declared his name and job description is Emmanuel God with us in other words you go before us and you come behind us and you become the cloud by day and the pillow of fire by night I just need some Somebody crazy enough to say, I know what God has done. Hallelujah. The last thing so that we we'll let you go on time. Thank you. How do I find God in my fight? When we read First Samuel chapter 17, here's what we find. I can't wait for the day when we have to preach one hour sermon. Somebody say amen. Amen. This 1520 is really hard, but here it is. God. Jesus I know, in order for you to find God in your fight, listen to me. Just, just imagine your fight. I don't care what your fight is. In order for you to find God in the fight, here it is. First Samuel 17 teaches us this, Gail, that God will take care of what you go through. God will take care of what you go through. Somebody ought to blow that thing right there. God will take care of what you go through, but it's not over. It's not over. God will take care of what you go through, but you take care of how you go through. What you say now, Pastor? Preach! So here it is. If you are not winning the fight, it's not God who is failing. Because God will take care of what you go through. But you take care of how you go through. That's why God says, be anxious for nothing. He's fixing your how to go through. Don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. Because God will take care of the what. But you must handle the how. You must have the faith to believe that I walk by faith and not by sight. That's how I go through it. God will take care of the what. God will take care of Goliath. But the Bible says, I'm finishing now. The Bible says, David, when the, guy, when the giant spoke to him, David says, this is how I will take care of it. God will take care of you. But I want you to understand this is how God, how I'm going to take care of it. When you read verse 42 to 47, David says, the giant spoke to him and David said, no, no, no. You are not going to have the last word. Amen. The giant spoke first and David spoke later. David says, listen, God will take care of what? But I'm going to take care of how. I cannot be silent when the enemy is saying stuff because words matter. Words have the power of life and death in them. De Goliath had spoken death to him and David spoke life to himself and death to the giant. And the next thing he did, was this. In other words, don't let your giant trash talk you. Don't, don't, don't let your giant trash talk you. I was watching this uh, this uh, 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 Jordan, Michael Jordan's thing, The Last Dance. And one thing we discovered, not only was Michael Jordan a bad boy, 
with the ball, but his mouth was bad too. Anybody notice that? Uh, all right. He, he was the greatest trash talker of all time. So he made people mad by what he said to them. Some of us are not finding God in our fight because brothers and sisters, the truth be said, we are letting the giant trash talk you. God will take care of what you go through, but you take care of how you go through it. Here's what it is. David says, listen, you come to me with a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. I am coming in the name of the Lord. Watch this. It didn't just say it's standing. The Bible says he ran toward the giant. You and you <laughs> run toward your problem. It, that's how you take care of it. In other words, you cannot conquer what you don't confront. I don't care what your giant is. If you if you are on the defensive, it means the giant is on the offensive. When David ran to Goliath, he took charge of the fight. Goliath had to defend himself because David was offending on him. And the book says the man got mad. He threw off his helmet. Every giant, his strengths and weaknesses. The moment he threw off his helmet, then David said, in the name of the Lord, not my power, not my strength, because God will take care of what you go through. The moment he released it, it was rolling by his heart to get there. You can find God in your heart. I don't care what you're going through. You must be faithful even unto death. Because God didn't cause it. God only allows it. And God uses what he allows. Somebody blow your hole right there. So you want to say, Pastor, uh, uh, pray for me. I want to find God in my fight. Anybody? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you don't have to share with me what your fight is. Let me tell you, if you're going somewhere, you have a fight. Can I get an amen? amen. Either you are, you are in a fight, coming out of a fight, getting into a fight. That's the life of a believer. You are in a fight, coming out of a fight, getting into a fight. In a fight, getting out of a fight, getting into a fight. That's the life of a believer. Paul says we wrestle not with what? Flesh and blood. In other words, we need to know how to fight. But find God in your fight. Yes. With our hands lifted, here it is. I want to pray for you. Father God, thank you so much for this moment. We are grateful that, Lord, you have brought us here not to embarrass us or to humiliate us or to beat us down, but you brought us here, God, to lift us up to the standard of great warriors that you produce throughout the Bible times. I pray, Lord, our desire this morning is that, Lord, we want to find you in our fight. When we find you, God, depression is not a friend. When we find you, God, discouragement has to go. When we find you, God, distress has to go. So we pray in a very special way that, Master, whilst our giants trash talk, we pray for the power of the word of God so that, Lord, we speak the words to every situation we are facing. Thank you for allowing a weakness in every giant that we face. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And amen again, Brother Gil. Thank you.